Hello. So in this video, I'm going to assume that your child or teen suffers from a restrictive eating disorder like anorexia and that you are working very hard at helping him or her to eat and that you want to know what to do when after a while your child seems stuck. How long should you help him or her at the table? What are your options? You might be at the refeeding stage. This is where you're requiring your child to eat what you're putting on their plate and you're aiming for rapid weight gain if your child is underweight. Or you might be at another stage where you're doing exposure and desensitization work on foods which your child used to eat but has been avoiding for a while. I have lots of tips to help you support your child to eat when it seems completely impossible. And I'm assuming you've seen these or you're going to check them out later. This video is specifically on when your child gets stuck. I'm Eva Musby. I am a parent and the author of a book and videos for parents. If you haven't yet come across concepts like refeeding and exposure to fear foods, and if you'd like to learn more about family-based treatment and the role of parents, check out some of my other videos, my book or website. So follow the links. Right, so let's get going. Before I go into specific tips, let's consider how is your life and your child's life organized to support meals. You need to appreciate quite how much dedication it takes you, the parent, to help your child to eat meal after meal and perhaps stopping exercising, purging or self-harm. Most of us have to make changes to our life for a few weeks or months. The risk with this is that we end up with so many unmet needs that we can't be the person we want to be for our children. We lose touch with compassion, and as I show in my other resources, compassion is absolutely key to getting results and to keeping yourself sane and perhaps even helping you have a good life in spite of everything. So keep checking with yourself. What help do you need? Do you need a friend or family member to take over some of what you normally do? Do you need some evenings off to relax and have fun? Do you need emotional support from a friend or professional? Our child's normal life can be on hold too for a few weeks or months. When my daughter was well enough to sit in school, but weight gain was a priority, breakfast was non-negotiable. This meant that sometimes she was late to school and sometimes she didn't make it at all because I wouldn't let her go on an empty stomach. One more generality. It helps to try and understand what's going on for our children. And with an eating disorder, what's most probably happening is that because of malnourishment and the way their brains are wired to respond to food and hunger cues, much of the time our children's experience is that eating is extremely scary. They may even have a bullying voice in their head telling them not to eat or else. Our children may feel disgust or fear in front of food, even when they're very hungry. So let's bear in mind that when they stop partway through their meal, it may be to avoid some pretty awful suffering. Now let's leave the generalities and get specific. In this video, we're looking at the situation where we're sitting next to our child at the dinner table, and we've done this for quite a while, and they're stuck. Perhaps they haven't eaten any of the meal, or perhaps they've eaten a small or major part of it. Or the issue might be over the last two grapes. We've already done our very best to get all the food eaten, and let's call that plan A. Eating disorders being what they are, it's pretty normal for plan A to fail some of the time. It could even be a good sign. It could show you're doing a great job of working on rapid weight gain or on tackling fear foods. So, you need a plan B. There is not a single plan B. There is no magic, no right or wrong way, and there's no research to tell us how to deal with an unfinished meal. This means that what worked for other families or what works in a treatment center may not serve your family very well, and vice versa. And what works for you this week may not be the best approach in a month's time. What's on your plan B at any time depends on what matters to you at this moment. And there may be several factors in play. It might be 
that it's the calories and nutritional content of the food that matter because of the state of your child's health. So then you might act differently if your child has stored on a whole plateful of pasta compared to if he or she is not eating the last two grapes of a good-sized meal. Now, perhaps what matters right now in your situation is being consistent and that you don't create an unhelpful precedent because you need to support your child meal after meal after meal. The last two grapes might matter because they're a way for you to show that you mean business. And you might also take into account your own resources. Are you still able to support your child in a productive way? Or are you about to explode with anger and blame or break down into tears? Let's see what plan B might look like in practice. If your main concern is medical safety and calories, you'll try and get your child to eat for as long as seems reasonable. Then you'll signal the end of the meal and you might insist on rest. You might cancel activities that stretch your child's limited precious resources or you'll take your child to hospital. Your child may jump to the conclusion that you're angry and that you want to punish him or her, so be clear about the safety aspect. Another option which doesn't work for everyone, is your child may manage an energy drink to make up for lost calories. Now that's just the missing calories. I know a treatment center where they provide an energy drink equivalent to the whole meal, even if the person has managed part of the meal. So if you do this, be aware you're moving into a carrot and stick approach. Another option you can use if your child is usually fine eating something different You'll need to see if swapping one food for another works for you or if it creates extra bargaining and anxiety. Another option is you'll add the missing calories to the next meal and you'll learn from experience if it's helpful to tell your child you're doing this or not. And another option is you could give both of you a break, after which you will call your child back to the table to continue with the meal. If your child is not used to eating and his or her tummy is sore, You could use the break to make a hot water bottle. Now, as we saw, your plan B might be about establishing that you are in charge. You're determined and you're not going to be bullied. And that way you can support your child meal after meal after meal. One way to do this is a zero tolerance brick wall approach. It's like saying, I won't accept anything less than 100% nutrition. Before I tell you more about this approach, I want to tell you of one other. This approach is the opposite of zero tolerance, and it might surprise and confuse you, so I'll come back to it. Basically, you'll decide the best option is to end the meal even when everything has not been eaten. This is not about giving up, but about acting like a wise, flexible, compassionate leader. Before I explain more, I want to flag up another thing for your plan B, and that's to give yourself an exit route. Ideally, you should have someone who can take over from you, and a way of signaling that you need them to take over now, before you break down. I know that's not always possible, but if you're the one everything rests on all the time, it might not be sustainable. So make teamwork a priority. If at any stage you're on your own and about to seriously mess up, You need a way to make a dignified exit, like, uh, oh dear, is that the time? I'm afraid I need to deal with an urgent email. As opposed to, I can't bear it anymore, I'm off. While we're talking about your emotional state, I want to offer some reassurance on one point. We parents can convince ourselves that if our child doesn't manage one meal, he or she will decide to stop eating altogether. The all or nothing thing is how the eating disorder talks. In practice, it's normal not to succeed at every meal and still make great progress. Now let's get back to what you can do if your priority is to show the eating disorder you mean business. Let's start with the approach that is about 100% nutrition 100% of the time or the brick wall or zero tolerance thing. This is where you're going to do your very best to make sure every last piece of food goes in. Do you remember how, at the beginning of a new school year, some of your teachers were strict and rule-bound, only to show their friendly side once they'd established their authority? 
Many parents use this tactic in the early days of refeeding. Some parents, who insist on 100% nutrition 100% of the time, have some kind of time limit for the meal, and they may or may not tell their child about this. After a certain amount of time, they will enforce sanctions. So this approach is, you eat everything, and I mean everything, or else. The sanctions are not necessarily justified on health grounds, but they are designed to incentivize, typically removing access to a mobile phone or games. Now, before you leap into a carrot and stick approach, I'd like you to know it's a lot more complicated and risky than you might first think. I have a lot to say about it, so check out my other resources. For some, 100% nutrition 100% of the time means that parents require their child to stay at the table for however long it takes to get every last crumb eaten. There's a mantra often quoted on parents' forum, which is, life stops until you eat. It can mean all sorts of rather different things, and for many parents it means you're not doing anything and you're not going anywhere until you eat. I know of parents who have kept their child at the table for many, many hours. For some, it's eventually been successful, and they reckon that one or more marathon sessions produced an important shift. For some, it's not worked. Their child still didn't eat, and everyone got extra stressed out. You could decide to keep your child at the table for however long it takes, as long as you're able to maintain a compassionate stance. There is so much you can do as long as you're not worn out, and I offer lots of suggestions in my book and videos. And all the same, there will be times when you've spent a very long time trying to get two grapes eaten, and you're going to wonder how much longer you want to keep trying. The 100% nutrition, zero tolerance, brick wall approach is normally a short-term tactic to silence your child's eating disorder voice by showing it that arguing against you and manipulating you and bullying your child isn't going to work. It states that food is medicine and that anything less than the full dose isn't good enough. Many parents report that a zero tolerance stance got their child on the path to recovery. The zero-tolerance approach can also have a role if your child is generally eating well but insists on leaving some small thing uneaten. Sometimes our children are secretly relieved that they have to eat, that there is no choice. But they can't afford to acknowledge this because of their internal eating disorder bully. So they consistently leave a symbolic bit of food on the plate. Maybe it helps them placate the eating disorder part, like, uh, see, I'm not really eating everything. I'm doing my best to get around my parents. So for a while, you might support your child to eat the last grape or two, but not get at all upset when that doesn't work, because your child is really doing quite a clever job of fooling his or her eating disorder bully. You're on the same team. But after a while, you might see this as a crutch, which your child is now capable of throwing off. At this stage, you might start insisting on the plate being wiped clean so that your child experiences that nothing bad happens. That's one more step towards normality. Because many parents are so grateful that a zero-tolerance brick wall stance worked, they can make it sound as though this is the only way for all situations for everyone. We've got to be careful about this because I have seen parents give up on family-based treatment or deny themselves the support of a parent's group because they believe a hardline approach is required and they've had bad results from it. In fact, different strategies work for different people. The only rule emerging from trials is that with parents who are very hostile and critical, outcomes are poor. And this doesn't mean that we parents have to be perfect. We all have bad days. Family-based treatment doesn't dictate how we feed our children as long as we show unconditional acceptance of our children. That means we try not to judge them, whatever their behavior. Let's move on to something which might look like the opposite of the brick wall. When your child has stalled over the meal for quite a while, your plan B might be, quite simply, to end the meal. Now this takes some skill and you need to be cautious about when and how you do this. But this can be a really fruitful way of working with refeeding and with exposure to fear foods. 
when it's not a good option is if you've not done very much to get your child to eat. If you let him or her off the hook too early, it could make things worse for next time. You don't want the eating disorder part of your child to go, yippee, my parents have backed off, so next meal I'll put up even more resistance and eat even less. So you're going to give lots and lots of compassionate support to try and get the food eaten. And when you declare the meal over, you need to show you're a wise parent, a compassionate leader who is in charge of treatment and who is an expert at delivering it. You want your child to trust that you can do this, that you are doing it. You're in charge of assessing a situation and working out the best way forward. You're giving verbal and non-verbal messages of compassion, of determination, and of confidence. So here's how it might sound. Darling, I'm really pleased you've managed three grapes out of five. That's three more than you thought were possible. And I know it's a huge challenge and it required a lot of courage from you. You've done exactly what needs to be done to make it easier next time. At this stage, depending on what matters here, you could replace the two uneaten grapes with something else. So you'd say, three grapes out of five is a success. At the same time, you do need the energy, so I'll get you a biscuit. And then you give a clear message that it's time to move on. So there's no bad feelings, no blame, no hopelessness. We get on with life. So that's when you propose an activity like, um, want to watch a movie? So what happens the next day? You put six grapes on the plate. And maybe your child thinks, three grapes is my limit. And that's quite possible. And maybe he or she is thinking, I'll eat five, but no way am I eating six. Or maybe he or she is thinking, I wonder if I can manage them all and be done with it. This is so boring. And I do want to be well enough to go on holiday. Who knows? We parents deal with uncertainty and get very confusing feedback. Either way, you're going to work hard at supporting your child to eat all the grapes on the plate. And your child might say, but you let me eat just three yesterday. And you'll say something like, yesterday three grapes was a huge challenge and you did really well. I think today you'll find six grapes is quite a bit easier. So go ahead and then how about we look on the internet for a present for grandma? Some parents and some treatment centers use strict rules of the you will eat everything or else variety. And when you have tube feeding and even restraint as the ultimate strategies, that can work. What can also work well is to make decisions according to a moment-by-moment assessment of the situation. It doesn't mean that you look indecisive or that you're open to manipulation. You can still be in charge, focused on recovery, confident and compassionate. Given that eating disorders, especially anorexia, are so much into black and white thinking, isn't it refreshing for parents to keep the ability to make flexible decisions? You might have been on the receiving end of this stance when you were in school and you had teachers who could get the best out of you because they inspired respect and trust, not because they enforced strict rules. So sometimes you will keep your child at the table to get 100% of the food eaten, And sometimes you will present alternative foods. And sometimes you will cancel an activity that would take up too many of your child's resources. And sometimes you will signal the end of the meal in an I'm a wise and caring parent type of way. And all these possibilities depend on your assessment of the situation. And you'll probably decide differently if you're on the first day of refeeding or if you're three months down the line working on desensitizing your child to the fear of ice cream. You'll also decide differently depending on whether your role is to be in charge or your role is to assist. Elsewhere, I explain how with bulimia and binge eating disorder, or with a young adult or adult sufferer, the parent's role may be more collaborative. You may have more teamwork, and that again will affect what you decide to do when there's food left on the plate. How do you decide which route to follow, which plan B is more likely to serve you well? There's no right or wrong, and the more you can remain in a compassionate state, the more you can bring your whole intelligence, that's the rational and the intuitive. You're looking for subtle indications of your child's state of mind. So you're observing body language and listening for what is said and what is not said and the tone of voice. 
From that, you're weighing up the odds of success if you follow one or the other option. And if you notice you're starting to tire, you're also weighing up your own capabilities and resources at that moment to see if you can stretch a little or if it's safer to give yourself a break. So that's an overview of what you can do if your child doesn't eat everything. Do subscribe to my videos and to my website to find out when I produce new resources. And I do very much appreciate your feedback, though before you comment on YouTube, check out the privacy settings for your child's sake. If what I've said here leaves you with more questions and some yes buts, that's to be expected. There is so much to know about this illness. So do check out my book where there's a lot more on this particular issue, as well as on the whole business of helping our children get well. Please remember, I don't know your particular situation, so do discuss all this with your child's clinicians to see which bits might be helpful in your situation and which might not. I really hope this video contributes to you and your family. If so, please tell other parents and clinicians about it. And I'll say goodbye now and wish you so very, very well.